Good, um, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to strategic management for a pandemicized world. I'm not sure that's the word, but there it is. <laughs> Uh, we have a, a very diverse uh, group of speakers today, and um, each person has um, a, a, a very different and very interesting background. Uh, and I'm going to um, just take a couple of minutes and uh, frame some thoughts about how um, my firm is thinking about this issue. Uh, my name is John Stroyer. I run Calvert Research and Management. Um, we're one of the larger responsible investor, activist investors in the world. Um, and I'm also on the board of our impact investing organization, Calvert Impact Capital. Um, and uh, I'm just checking to see if any other uh, speakers are coming on, but I think, I think we, are, we are who we are at the moment. Um, the topic that we've been asked to talk about is um, changes uh, to strategic management as a result of changes that we are experiencing um, as a result of the impact of the pandemic um, on our society, particularly thinking about this from the corporate level. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, each of our each of our speakers has a very distinct background um, and a very specific area of expertise. Welcome. Nice to see you again. Um, we're just getting started, I believe. Um, and uh, we got the signal that we're on, um, so we've we've gone live. Um, thank you for joining. Um, so I will I will call on um, each of our panelists um, who will make a few comments uh, on the topic from their perspective. Uh, also, um, each of our guests are um, doing very interesting work in um, impact or management areas. And I have also suggested uh, that we, we share some information about our current projects um, and things that we're discovering through our, our research or through our work, um, so I'm going to I'm going to get started. And um, Lindley, if you would like to lead off and share some thoughts on this topic, and also talk a little bit about some of the current work that you're doing, that'd be great. Thank you, thank you, John, and thank you, everyone. Um, I actually don't think we're in a post-pandemic um, world. I think it's an emergent world. So um, the, the sorts of things that I'm looking for are, it is looking at the aspects of where are the variances in demand. And this um, has brought forward a lot of digitization. This has also brought forward uh, a lot of changes in demand um, patterns. Um, and what I'm really looking at is what are alternative options for many of our clients and, and businesses I'm involved in. Um, where has perception of value and value change? Where has the expectation of um, ease of consumption and access? Where has availability changed? The supply chains have been disrupted. Where is there an experience in the environment? Where has there been changes in channel? And where um, it, are there changes in where something is actually consumed? Now, this is the sort of companies I work with are technology companies, and many of the ones with digital, uh, digitized companies are really interesting to be brought forward. Um, some of the things that they were hoping to have happen. But then on the other hand, I work a lot in the Pacific and, and Asia and in, look in the Pacific, um, a lot of the changes in tourism mean that we have to look at what other industries are available. So that comes with what, uh, quite a lot of pain. So really where what all this is bringing is the ability to do with complexity and uncertainty and your ability to look at not only what is changed and what is made up, but what is emerging. So that's, I'm really looking at value chain, customer journey, and, and where is the value chain of business. Great, um, thanks for sharing that. Um, just one, one um, concept that I'll offer, um, 
as the as the pandemic developed, uh, one of the projects that, that we undertook was something called the Test of Corporate Purpose. Um, and you may have seen some of the work. Um, we organized research teams in uh, Europe and the U.S. Um, to look at how specific large multinational corporations were actually faring as they came through the pandemic. Um, and we examined companies that had signed the um, uh, fairly recent um, stakeholder capitalism statements um, from Business Roundtable and World Economic Forum. Um, and then we examined how those companies were performing through the pandemic. And then we also looked at how companies that had scored well on traditional ESG metrics um, were performing during the pandemic. And um, as, you, as you might guess, um, we found that there wasn't a lot of correlation between the companies that had signed uh, the new statement of corporate purpose um, or the stakeholder capitalism statement and their actions during the pandemic. Um, however, we did find that the companies that had longstanding strong governance systems, longstanding um, enterprise risk management systems that incorporated management of environmental and social risks um, actually were performing quite well um, and had taken steps to retain people um, and were taking steps to protect safety um, and make a contribution. So I think the, you know, for us, the, t you know, the takeaway that we got from, from that work, of course, um, is that there's a cultural aspect um, to a company um, that's built up by their policies, their processes, and their long-term um, operating model and controls that had a big impact and differentiated how one company did during the pandemic versus others, um, but more recent short-term um, you know, commitments to purpose or multi-stakeholderism um, just were not, not seeming to have any real impact. We can talk more about that, but I thought I'd, I'd offer that in between um, speakers. And um, uh, Robin, it looks like you have an opinion about that. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, yes, I, I do. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here just by way of introduction. Much of what, what much of the work I do is around the future of work and I've written four books on the topic. And, you know, I, the thing that I've observed in the work that I do with large multinationals is, is a pivot, if you will, from our traditional strategies and their primary outcome measures of growth, efficiency and return to a much greater sensitivity to these notions of resilience, flexibility and agility within our business models. And certainly, down to your point, this focus on ESG has, certain, has been front and center for many but I also think the underpinnings of the operating model and what they're calibrated to are starting to change. And specifically, um, five things seem to be coming to the, rising to the fore and in support of this pursuit of resilience, flexibility, and agility. The first being a more portfolio-based approach to thinking about work. How do we seamlessly pivot um, work from being done by employees to automation, to gig talent, to onshoring versus outsourcing, and do we have the measurement systems in order to be able to understand where one source of work maybe is threatened and another may represent a viable alternative and doing so in a responsible way. The second key issue is this notion of how do we, in a much more agile way, connect talent to work through means that go beyond that traditional notion of a person match to a job. So from the traditional one-to-one -one relationships to a much more agile construct where talent flows to work in a much more seamless fashion. We're seeing this with internal marketplaces as well as external marketplaces. So the notion of many-to-many, -many, if that makes sense. The third element of this is um, how do we shift decision-making from the center where it's often reactive, often binary in, in, how it, in how we make decisions 
to driving greater diversity and agility by shifting more and more decision making to the edges. The edges where innovation happens, the edges where diversity is probably valued the most, the edges where efficiency is pursued and customer relationships managed. Um, the fourth dimension is something that many of us have, can relate to, the notion of um, a, you know, the distributed enterprise and how every one of our organizations is the hub and or the spoke of a digital ecosystem. So how do we collaborate for the greater good versus perhaps um, suffering as individual silos? We've seen a lot of that, certainly in the pandemic. And I've heard many a CEO talk about how we, how we might extend this collaboration, um, not just when times are bad, but when times are good. And then the last, I think, is a fundamental pivot in the deal that we have with the world. truly trumping um, all the, the legacy deal, um, which was primarily the promise of security. So five key sort of factors, if you will, that underpin the, the pivot that I talked about. You know, I think that's very interesting. And I think um, just for uh, everyone listening and our um, co-speakers, um, your work is currently available on MIT Sloan, recently published a summary there. Um, you mentioned uh, John. Um, so when I talk about relevance, I'm really trying talking about um, this intense focus that we now have across um, companies around upskilling and reskilling their workforces. And, and I think the, the thing that the progressive organization, the, the, the greatest promise a progressive organization, private enterprise that is, can, can make to a, a worker is the promise of continued relevance for a changing world, um, as opposed to the promise of continued employment. I think that is, um, you know, that, that security can only come from governments. Um, for a private enterprise, I think the best we can do is and we promise the individual that they will stay relevant both within the enterprise as well as for their next opportunity. Great. Training, skill development, growth development. Thank you. Absolutely. Anita, would you like to give us a few thoughts? Hi. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Um, are you talking to me, John? Hi, Abid. Thank you for joining from Pakistan. Um, Actually, I was calling on Anita, um, so we'll come back to you in just a moment. Go ahead, Anita. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, tend, I, I work mostly with companies on the earlier end of the spectrum, i.e. basically fundraising. Um, so um, for the, what, I think what I would say, again, just coming from a perspective of very early stage and, and um, um, basically... I, I, I cannot kind of, hear her. I, I oh, think there's oh. a sound issue. Can you guys... Can anyone else hear me? Hey, you. We can hear you. You're good. Keep going. Okay. Um, anyway, I what I have been reading and, and talking to um, startups about and founders is, you know, just keep thinking long-term because it's pretty easy to think about how to fix this because now we're in this now and it's very short term. Um, I think something I always say to people I work with, I guess before the pandemic as well, maybe not so much before, but definitely now is raise it when you can, not when you have to. You know, everyone says, oh, I just want to raise a little bit now and then, you know, and then build it up. And that's great. But if you can, I would say break it all in now because, um, you know, gives you a longer runway, uh, you know, 100% of zero is still zero. You know, everyone wants to maintain their equity and I get that. Um, and that is a problem, that is a real problem. But um, kind of given what we're seeing now and given the amount of companies going out there right now, looking to start and some out of the pandemic, right? Um, 
I think uh, that that sort of is my two cents. But again, I'm more work, you know, on the earlier end of the scale. So great. Different than Thanks. It. Thanks, Anita. Um, and Tatio? Yes. Would you hear uh, yeah. um, Yes. Um, talking of pandemic, uh, actually, last week, it's a uh, uh, 10 years anniversary, 10 years memorial of the tsunami disaster, uh, you know, uh, hit Japan 10, uh, 10 years ago. And my hometown, uh, you know, was completely disrupted actually and the uh, because i uh, sorry um i'm running a lifestyle management company concert service company for high net worth japanese high net worth families and uh, at that time 10 years ago um the rio or you know disasters tsunami disasters um there are two tendencies uh, Two trends, two tendencies of my clients. Uh, one is the uh, people, especially women, uh, start to get married. And the other one is the, um, you know, uh, uh, people, uh, you know, uh, travel longer. And the, you know, some people, you know, start to. You know, start to live abroad or uh, living, living a dual life between, you know, Japan and Singapore, uh, like me, uh, Japan and Australia or something like that. So oh, I think that it's uh, simply because they, um, uh, they are aware of, how do I say, life is short, something. <laughs> so. Uh, I think the um, this is one. I think this is one of the hints uh, to overcome for us to overcome this pandemic. And the another aspect, the uh, the five companies uh, out of the top all the top ten all the companies is in Japan. Uh, Sui is the carpenters company. Carpenters specialized in shrine making shrine for uh, temples only. Or two companies is a hot spring company, uh, onsen or hot spring company. So I think the uh, this is another hint for us to, to overcome uh, to this pandemic. It's I, uh, I mean it's you know finally leading to the how do I say people's mental health as well as physical health so that's my first opinion great um thank you and let's just uh, go with one of your concepts and ask uh, for others to comment on that um, one of the points that you made was that when presented with a crisis um, you used the uh, tsunami um, as an example you mentioned that people become worried or concerned. Um, what about the other angle of that? Do we think that as a result of going through the pandemic, um, we have companies and people who are much more aware um, that systemic risks are, are here, they're front and center? Um, and do we think that some segment of our society will attend to these risks? So do we believe that as a result of experiencing the pandemic, um, that the uh, governing institutions that we depend upon to help manage risk globally, large corporations, NGOs, governments, do we believe that they will do a better job of attending to other long-term global risks like climate change, inequality, unfairness, unjustness, or do we think that this will cause the world to go backwards, shrink back into nationalism? Um, what, what might we expect from our learnings? And a big welcome. Um, I can see that there's a little challenge, but you're right side up, front and center. Um, so why don't we go to you? You've come from a long, oh, go the other way. Turn it back the way you had it and you'll be right side up again. 
There we okay. go. All right. you to, um, speak. Thank you. All right. Um, sorry about that. I, I don't have the desktop and I didn't realize that uh, you you need the desktop there. Um, I thought the laptop and the desktop has become obsolete um, coming from the Silicon Valley. Anyway, sorry about that. So um, we have done some uh, research uh, um, on the middle class. Uh, we have been watching um, China, USA, and some countries um, in Europe. Um, and there has been some some numbers uh, that, that you can see uh, if you dig a little bit deeper. Um, since uh, the uh, 60s or probably in the early 70s, the corporations made a shift um, from the stakeholders to the shareholders. And what that did uh, to the working class in the U.S., the salaries or the wages were stagnated and um, the shareholders, especially the rich shareholders, they started making uh, a lot of money and that created uh, a, a, a inequality and also the middle class shrank from 56% to 42%. Now, if you look at the China, uh, their middle class was 6% in 2000, and they did a remarkable progress um, going from 6% to 50%. That's 700 million uh, people pulling out of poverty and then uh, pushing them into the middle class. So the, the question is uh, the upward mobility, are we focusing on the upper middle class to the high class or from uh, the poverty or to the low income, uh, to the middle class. So if you have a healthy middle class, um, that we have seen uh, creates a real prosperity instead of uh, pushing um, um, few people from the upper middle class to the middle class. Uh, if you look at the taxes uh, in the 50s and the 60s, the millionaires were taxed 91%. And uh, there were one earner in the family. Uh, people would buy the house on cash. Uh, we didn't have the uh, education issue. The education was, was largely free. Now the education has become expensive. And now you can see about $1 trillion debt uh, the, the, the children who are graduating. And that's putting a lot of pressure on the family. The parents are spending their uh, retirement fund uh, to uh, to uh, for their children's education. Uh, so there is a lot of stress on the middle class. Um, now, if you look at the middle class, the middle class pays uh, about seventy percent of the taxes, and they are also the consumers. So the corporations, especially the large corporations, they should recognize that if the middle class is large and healthy, that actually, uh, you know, put them in a, in a good situation because they are the consumers. As we were talking, um, John, uh, yesterday, that uh, the rich don't spend much money and the poor don't have any money to spend. So it is extremely important that uh, we increase the size of our uh, middle class. Uh, there was one report uh, that, that I was looking at uh, the Germany increase uh, the median household income or for their skilled labor uh, five times faster than the U.S. So, but in the U.S., the pro productivity went up, uh, but the salary was a stagnant. Now, if the U.S. had increased the salaries uh, for their skilled labor uh, with the same rate as the Germany, uh, the median uh, family income would have been the double what we have today. So, so these are the numbers that um, when you uh, dig a little bit below the surface, you will see the real issue 
uh, in our U.S. Uh, and uh, the pandemic has made it worse, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, but but the amazing thing is, uh, um, I, I also heard some reports that uh, the billionaires uh, added about one trillion dollar to their coffers, while uh, the middle class has shrank even further. So so these are the issue I think uh, we are, we are facing in the U.S. and also in uh, some of the other countries. So I stop yeah. there. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up this very important topic. Um, I think when we spoke about it, um, we didn't like the term inequality. We liked the term unjust, unfair. And you're also bringing to the to the to the point. It doesn't make any sense um, because, in fact, the condition weakens the overall economic system that we depend on for future growth and development. Um, those are very good points. And I think as you closed, you related it to the pandemic, which has been much harder on um, people who earn less because their jobs are more dependent on their presence, often in crowded and difficult situations. So let's go back to the question. And there, uh, I think everybody here shares your view. Um, I, I think I can speak for the group in that respect. Um, we uh, we know the solutions have not been forthcoming. Um, do we believe that as a result of going through the pandemic and witnessing, uh, I think, the brutal circumstances that the poor and, and um, lower paid uh, parts of the population are enduring, do we believe that our governments, do we believe that our companies either have solutions or will actually take action uh, to change this condition, and how would that happen? Robin, your theories on, on, on work um, and employment and the future of work, um, do they apply to people in these positions, or do they mostly apply to knowledge workers? Yeah, I, John, I think they do apply to people in these positions, but I think the conditions to reverse the the, the unjust conditions, right, um, are absent, are largely absent, particularly in the United States. We need a heck of a lot more collaboration between government, industry, and academia to close those gaps. Because right now, to the point that was made earlier, um, if you can afford to pay for a private education, then you're in a position to close the gaps on your own. But for the masses, they are left largely to the... Uh, to the mercy of their employers, you know, are they willing to, as we talked about, ensure that the continued relevance of the workforce? Um, they're left to the mercy of um, uh, of city of, um, of of public educational institutions, you know, like the city colleges of Chicago, who actually have done a tremendous job of closing some of the technical skill gaps. But those are such isolated examples, and I think you only have to look at, albeit on a different scale. Denmark and Singapore um, as examples of where that collaboration works really quite well and where it's planful and thoughtful. And reskilling and upskilling are closely aligned to the industry evolution plans, particularly in Singapore with their Skills Future Initiative. So I do think there's some good models out there, um, but there truly is, is a paucity of uh, of good ideas, particularly in the United States at this point. Uh, not that the ideas don't exist, I think they just haven't been applied. And when we point to examples where things are different, we tend to look to different countries. And I think one has to ask the question, are those conditions caused by governance or are those cultural norms that are embedded in entire societies? And of course, solutions for one condition would be very different from solutions for another. You talked about collaboration between uh, academia, uh, private enterprise, government. Of course, we've got uh, the United Nations Global Compact, uh, a large organization that exists to make that happen. They brought the Sustainable Development Goals forward. Each one of the conditions that you both discussed are goals to solve by 2030. Um, and will the pandemic accelerate our progress or slow it? Lindley, um, you think a lot about helping uh, the underserved impact investing. What do you think? 
Oh, well, I don't think it's easy answers, and I think that when these solutions arrive, they arrive differently. Like I would say that the US is leading um, in a lot of the micro credentialing, um, but they don't, might not be calling it upskilling and reskilling. So sometimes these things are being addressed, but you don't realise they are being addressed. Um, and there is cultural, and I really noticed that we spend a lot of time in the US, and a lot of time in Australia and Asia. And there are countries with more social fabric. Um, when I say social fabric, I mean social fabric caused by government than in the US. But then the US has a very strong social fabric caused by often by community. So everything has a cultural overlay. And we can look at other people and think they've got it right. But often we can't see what's in our own backyard. So for me, um, part of upskilling and reskilling is for people to understand the pathway out of where they are to what they may need. And so in the Pacific, we are trying to work at very micro level at um, creation of enterprise because if we don't have tourists, what are the underlying industries we have and how do we work with what we have on the ground and then how do we link all these small things together and create something larger. And as an example, what we do in the National Bank of Vanuatu is we do a lot of on the ground education in the local language. And often people wanna do these courses, not once, they'll do them three times. Then we help them set up a business. But then when they've got a business, what we will do is we then come in and create structures so that if you're, you know, might be growing carver, then we create a carver co-op so that all the small businesses come together and then they're able to then transact into light, you know, into a more global supply chain. So it bottom up needs to happen as well as top down. And I don't think you need to wait for government to solve a lot of problems. I think we have to take um, both community by community and hope the government comes along, but I'm not looking at often government to lead anything. Um, you've got to activate where you are. Very interesting. And, and one of the common themes that's starting to emerge is access to education. And um, a bit, I know that is uh, something that you invest in uh, professionally. I want to come back to that in a minute. But Anita, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, that we're kind of segueing into talking about the problem, which of course has been um, really made a lot worse by the pandemic of uh, poverty and difficulty of the middle class keeping up um, and the uh, unfairness and unjustness of all that. Uh, what do I think of it? I think it's, um, I mean, it, I think it's true. <laughs> I don't have much, much more to say than what everyone else has said, but um, but you know, I think part of the reason I entered, did started working in blockchain was that whole point of that industry was to try to help people in those worlds and um, sort of, you know, what I guess two companies I'm helping right now are are trying to work on increasing that um, middle class, if you will, in Latin America, which is, um, you know, the, the, there's a one company trying to offer free mobile and the other one with remittances because yeah they are you know left with so many more disadvantages than we are and we take advantage we take everything for granted that i didn't realize we took for granted until i actually started working with these companies and, and um i said you know i i can't not try to help you it's hard as hell right now to, to try to find people that i know to invest in startups that are focusing on mexico but i think um we have to do it Thank you. Our research has shown that one of the greatest drivers of inequality is lack of access, lack of access to education, lack of access to finance, lack of access to opportunity generally. That lack of access comes about for many reasons. Sometimes it's racial bias, gender bias. Um, there are many, many reasons that, that uh, lack of access um, occurs. Um, but, um, uh, Abide, would you talk a little bit about education? Because I know that's an area that you have um, some specific knowledge in, particularly outside of the United States. And do you find any 
any models that exist that would solve one of the problems that you identified, which is the expense of an education and access to quality education for poor people or lower middle class people. Yeah. Um, well, as we, as we talk, you know, puts back uh, in, the, in the communities. I, I remember when I was going to the community college in California, the education was free, but now they, they charge for it. And, um, you know, I, I remember uh, I graduated with $40,000, but now my children, uh, they are paying $120,000 uh, upward uh, for the higher education. So, uh, because the government uh, is not getting the revenue from the corporations and from the middle class, uh, the government does not have enough money to spend on the education. And it doesn't matter if it is the U.S. or a Asian country or even a European country there. So it is, it is crucial that uh, the tax revenue that we are not receiving from the corporations or from uh, the upper uh, 10%, uh, and and the if you if you look at uh, the Henry Ford time in the 50, he doubled the wages of his employees, and we are in a situation where wages are half. So I think uh, is the uh, is is a greed factor that we have, uh, and the responsibility that. Uh, the uh, the rich community, and it doesn't matter if it is if that community is in U.S. or in Europe or in Asia. Um, I have seen the rich community or the upper one percent; they behave pretty much the same. It doesn't matter where they are. Uh, and uh, I forgot to mention uh, about the Swiss example. They have the wealth tax, and we don't. We have only the income tax, and we have the property tax. And if you look at the Switzerland, they have 4% wealth tax. They even collect taxes from the beehives and the cows. So, and, and we know that uh, Elizabeth Warren has been talking about this wealth tax. And the, uh, the sad thing is that Democrats who are supposed to be helping the middle class and the low income people, they have turned their backs uh, on, on their own voters. Uh, when it comes to so uh, the when it comes to the education, uh, it is important that the funding should come from the government. I mean, if you look at the Germany, I think uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, from pre-K to the PhD, the funding is coming from the government, and we don't have that in the U.S. Uh, actually, uh, there is a one trillion dollar debt uh, that the students are in. Uh, so when they graduate, uh, uh, they have the payment that they need to pay for the house, or should they make the payment on the debt that they have? So, uh, so, so this is a situation in the in the education there that uh, um, the government don't give, you know, uh, or help the people. Um, I believe that you have to demand from the government. Great, thank you. We just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I want to give an opportunity to Ravin to tell us about his latest book. What is it? Where can people get it? And remind us about the presence on Sloan. And then, Abby, I want to come back to you, and you can tell people where your research is online. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, so my, my next book, is it will be published by MIT. It's called Work Without Jobs. Um, we just had a Sloan Management Review article get published last week. That was a precursor for the book. And um, and so so please do go uh, take a look at that Sloan piece as a as as a sneak preview to some of the ideas. Great, thank, thank you. you, thank you. And Abby, do you have a research center, um, a non for profit? Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and where people can find it? Yeah, it's a very small organization. We are, we're running on a very little funding. Uh, we do research on social issues. We also have. Uh, 
uh, done some research on the on the economy, and this research on the middle class came from that organization. So uh, the social issues we we found out that very much linked to the economy, and the economy is is affected by the social issues. So it's it's a very interesting thing. Great, thank you. I think our official time um, has been um, consumed. Um, Anita, Lindley, do you have any final comments that you'd like to make? Um, I will just say, have a look at, uh, if you're looking at education and this micro-credentialing and micro and how education becomes affordable, have a look at a, a, a US company called Ubiquity University that I've just got on the board of, and this is it's seeking to address cost-effectively a lot of the education access